All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Saru Rankelawan, and welcome to our Boss Investor webinar uh, for this month of October 2023. And today we're going to be talking about the budget for fiscal 2024 and its potential investor implications. Now, it would have been, Sydney, it would have made for interest in reading uh, and listening from the minister's uh, budget statement in re recently. And uh, we're going to take a look again at how that may affect investor sentiment. What were some of the more notable fiscal measures? Of course, we're going to take a look at some of the key macro indicators as well and gauge what opportunities, if any, if there may be uh, on the horizon for investors. And finally, we're going to take a look at investor positioning, what that sentiment ultimately is going to do to affecting how an investor may want to position their particular portfolios and what are the types of investments they may want to shift more towards and shift more away from. All right, so let's get straight into it. And firstly, we're just going to quickly go through some of the housekeeping for today. Um, please feel free at any time during the presentation to submit your questions in our Q&A box. There is an investor sentiment pool that has been launched. It's six very easy uh, multiple choice questions. Um, we would really appreciate it if you could complete it during the webinar and it would give us some very valuable feedback about how you are feeling. Uh, the presentation time is going to be approximately 35 minutes or thereabout. And of course, at the end, as always, we're going to have that live Q&A session where I will try to answer as many questions of yours as possible on the spot, together with the help of my very capable team, who I would like to thank in advance for putting together a lot of the content that you're going to see today. So, getting straight into it, the fiscal 2024 budget and overview. Let's take a look firstly at that big picture, some of the, big, the high level numbers. So, for fiscal 2024, revenues are projected at around 54 billion, which is pretty much in line with that figure of 53.8 billion that is expected to be registered in the now concluded fiscal 2023. Expenditure is expected to climb just a bit around three and a half percent up to 59.2 billion. However, current expenditure, as we'll see in subsequent slides, uh, is anticipated to be pretty much in line with that same level of spending in fiscal 2023. The fiscal gap or deficit is expected to widen to just about $5.2 billion or 1.8% or 2.7% rather of the GDP. Uh, and real GDP growth for both fiscal 2023 and 2024 uh, is anticipated to be in uh, the area or the vicinity of 2.7% or thereabouts. Let's take a closer look at the revenue side of the budget equation. And as we would have mentioned, there does appear to be some degree of stabilization in revenues for fiscal 2022. For example, total revenue came in at around 54.6 billion and it has maintained at around or near those levels in fiscal 2023 and indeed is projected to be around those same levels in fiscal 2024. Now, most of that revenue is current uh, with just a very small amount uh, uh, attributable to capital revenues from asset sales and other capital revenue sources. When we break down revenues just a bit more into oil revenue versus non-oil revenue, we can see that non-oil revenue in that dark blue segment is beginning to play more and more of an important role to TNT's overall revenue equation. In fact, in fiscal 2022, non-oil revenue was about 32 billion. In fiscal 2023, it's projected to be just about 32 billion as well, 31.8 billion. And in fiscal 2024, it's in, it's, it's forecast to increase to around 35 and a half billion, whereas Oil revenues, on the other hand, projected for fiscal 2024 are anticipated uh, to decline to just about 16.7 billion, down from its roughly estimated 22 odd billion for fiscal 2023. Now, it's important to know that oil revenue includes tax and non-tax uh, income from oil and gas companies, 
and does not include petrochemical companies which are included in that non-oil revenue segment. So certainly, again, just to re reinforce that non-oil revenues what is forecast to, uh, to play a more important role in terms of over, overall revenue generation uh, in the Trinidad and Tobago budget equation. Now, on the oil side, oil and gas side, or the oil revenue side, we can see that there has been something of a stabilization to the lower end of production in natural gas uh, within the Trinidad and Tobago domestic production environment, where for fiscal 2023, it's projected that produ production would be just around 2.6 billion standard cubic feet per day. Uh, for 2024 and 2025 as well, uh, those with the projections around 2.5 to 2.6 billion standard cubic feet per day, the Honorable Minister of Finance did allude to stabilization of natural gas production being a priority over the next two years with medium term growth uh, from significant projects coming on stream uh, driving uh, driving that increase in production beyond the 2025. On the oil price and production front, uh, there has been uh, pretty much uh, stagnant uh, production in terms of crude oil ho hovering around that 56 to 57,000 uh, barrel per day level. Uh, but natural gas, of course, would play a much more critical role in terms of overall revenue gen oil revenue generation uh, in the Trinidad and Tobago uh, budgetary equation. When we turn to expenditure trends, what we would notice is that, again, as mentioned earlier, current expenditure is expected to stabilize at around that 53 odd billion dollar level with capital expenditure for fiscal 2024 expected to expand from its projected 3.8 billion in fiscal 2023 to just about 6.2 billion in fiscal 2024. And that is really the major change uh, based on forecasts of uh, expenditure trends into fiscal 2024. It should be noted that for fiscal 2023, capital expenditure was also budgeted at around $6.2 billion. Uh, that ultimately fell short in terms of revised uh, projections for fiscal 2023 that's now concluded of around 3.8 billion. But it's important to note that post COVID, there has been a steady increase in that capital expenditures um, allocation and spending. And indeed, the Honorable Minister of Finance did stress that there is a prioritization of capital expenditure going forward, given that it stimulates the economy, creates employment, etc. So let's turn to some of the macro indicators and forecasts. And we're going to talk a little bit in this section about growth, the fiscal balance, and debt, and the level of indebtedness. Firstly, the Honorable Minister of Finance would have mentioned that uh, growth, for, growth forecasts for fiscal 2023 and 2024, respectively, in that green segment would be, again, around that 2.7% level. This broadly corresponds to the IMF's World Economic Outlook's most recent, and that's October 2023 publication, where for Trinidad and Tobago, growth for 2023 is forecast at around 2.5%, and for fiscal 2024 would be forecast at around 2.2%. So there is that uh, convergence in terms of growth estimates between the Ministry of Finance as well as the IMF, which suggests that uh, those estimates may uh, have increasing credibility uh, going forward. When we take a look at the real GDP story in that uh, purplish segment, we can also see that it's a story of improvement again post COVID. In fiscal 2019, for example, real GDP was around the $165 billion mark. Uh, post COVID, it, or, or during COVID, would have, it would have fallen to about $148 billion in fiscal 2021 and has continuously have been recovering with real GDP projected to be around the $154 billion mark in 2023, uh, with some moderate growth to about $159 odd billion in 2024. So again, this is one of the positive stories that is coming out or that would have been portrayed uh, in the recent uh, budgetary uh, budget delivery. In terms of it, the fiscal balance trends, uh, we can see that after registering 
uh, 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 fiscal surplus in fiscal 2022 of 0.6% of GDP or $1.3 billion. There has been that return to deficits, as mentioned in fiscal 2023, the deficit is now projected at 3.4 billion or 1.8% of GDP. Whereas in fiscal 2024, that uh, fiscal deficit is expected to widen further to just around 5.2 billion or 2.7 percent of uh, region or of GDP rather. Uh, and that widening deficit is or could be a cause for concern, but we'll take a look as to why it may not be as big a concern for the Trinidad and Tobago economy at this particular point in time. This is just a longer term history of surplus and deficit trends where we would observe that total revenues have consistently been since uh, fiscal 2012 have consistently been below uh, expenditures, which are typically uh, stickier in nature than revenues, which particularly for an, in, for an energy-oriented economy such as Trinidad and Tobago can be subject to some volatility. And that is clearly evident uh, in that green line of total revenue, which has really bounced around, whereas uh, total expenditures has been relatively sticky uh, with some uh, modest increases over the past few fiscal years. Now we're talking about, we're getting back to that level of indebtedness and debt to GDP. And based on our adjusted general government debt as a percentage of GDP ratio, which is the internationally accepted, uh, benchmark, internationally accepted benchmark, um, we would note that adjusted, well, that debt to GDP ratio would have fallen in fiscal 2022 to about 67 odd percent. It's subsequently increased in fiscal 2023 to about 71 percent. And with the anticipated deficit financing going into fiscal 2024, it could increase just a touch uh, at the end of uh, fiscal 2024. However, the Minister of Finance did forecast that it would be relatively within the soft target or the government's soft target of 75% debt to GDP, which is within acceptable uh, international standards. As we can see in that, uh, that green segment or the green uh, columns, adjusted general government debt continues to increase. And again, it's forecast to further increase in uh, 20, or the fiscal period of 2024. Notwithstanding that increase in, uh, in debt levels, uh, Trinidad and Tobago's credit rating outlook remains relatively upbeat. And recently, uh, Moody's would have upgraded its outlook on the Trinidad and Tobago uh, credit rating to positive. Uh, from stable, whereas S&P Global would have, would, would have increased their outlook or improved their outlook uh, to stable from negative. S&P would have awarded or assigned a rating to Trinidad and Tobago, triple B minus, which is investment grade, and Moody's of PE2, which is just below uh, investment grade, two notches below, in fact, uh, in, within that speculative grade territory, but with a positive uh, rating outlook. Um, there is the probable, increasing probability that that rating could be upgraded in subsequent periods. One of the major issues uh, and topics that has been on the minds of investors uh, and the general citizenry alike has been uh, access to foreign exchange and whether or not there is, in fact, a foreign exchange. And I'm using this term very loosely, quote unquote, prices in Trinidad and Tobago. And let's take a look at some of the objective data to determine whether or not uh, there is that, in fact, a concern, or is, is that concern warranted, or are things re reasonably in control for the time being? Well, we would have taken here at most, based on central bank available data, a historical look at average monthly sales of foreign exchange to the public in that blue line as well as average monthly purchases of foreign exchange from the public, as well as the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. And the sales are being made by the, and, and purchases are being made by uh, commercial banks and author, well, well, authorized dealers. Uh, and what we can see uh, is generally where there is a green, a green bar, there has been a surplus in terms of purchases being above sales uh, to, to the public. And historically, there has been more uh, currency available and uh, purchases as opposed to sales to the public. 
2023 year to date, and this is data available as of August. On average, for example, um, there has been a net uh, sales in excess of purchases of around 55 million USD on a monthly basis. So this may be accounting for some of the for some of the tightness in the foreign exchange market and the, the perceived uh, feeling of uh, a lack of availability of foreign exchange. Certainly, uh, there is some degree of prioritization in terms of foreign exchange. Uh, but when we take a look at the level of international reserves, for example, we could note that since uh, 2019 or thereabouts, the level of net official reserves has hovered around that $6.9 billion, $7 billion figure uh, throughout uh, 2019 to 2022, for example, even throughout the period of a very significantly affected period of uh, COVID, which would have rattled energy markets. Uh, as at September 2023, uh, the level of net official reserves has fallen to about $6.4 billion. Uh, when we take a look at the month of import cover, that since 2018, the, the, the current level or the current time has ranged between eight to roughly eight and a half times of import of months of import cover. How does that stack up relative to international standards? Well, the internationally accepted benchmark for economies, uh, months of import cover is around three months. So while objectively, we can see that there has been a decline in that months of import cover uh, to around that eight to eight and a half time level, what we do notice is that there has been a, some degree of stabilization uh, over the past a few fiscal years with the odd bits of volatility here and there. Now, in terms of our heritage and stabilization fund, what we've also seen is some degree of recovery in the value of the fund. Uh, indeed, there was that uh, injection during the course of 2022 of around $346 million. And what we would have noticed is in tandem with some recovery in financial market valuations, uh, the level of the heritage and stabilization fund as at September 2023 would have recovered to about the five and a half billion dollar level and that's pretty much where it would have been uh, over over the course of the past few years uh, rising to as much as 6.3 billion dollars and you would have seen of course uh, justifiably so um, some significant withdrawals on account of uh, COVID related spending necessary spending but since then there has been that recovery in the fund back to around that five and a half billion US dollar level so again in the context of manageable uh, international reserves, uh, a fairly significantly robust um, level in terms of the heritage and stabilization fund. Uh, going as far as, as saying that there is some uh, concern or significant concern or crisis in terms of access to foreign exchange, um, there certainly appears to be some degree of prioritization, but on the aggregate and macro level, uh, data, it doesn't appear to be any degree of crisis at this point in time. So turning away from the macro level uh, indicators, we, we're looking at some of the notable fiscal measures which would have come out of the reading of the fiscal 2024 budget and certainly uh, which may have an impact on investor sentiment and consumer demand. So there were a couple initiatives that we'd like to discuss here today. The firstly being the implementation of property tax on residential properties. And this has been one of the less popular, um, but very well telegraphed uh, initiatives in terms of revenue generation, uh, but perhaps less, less popular, but uh, ultimately necessary in terms of uh, generating that those streams of non-oil revenues uh, to fund state expenditure. So just an example at an individual level, Again, if your property, your residential property, of which there are 400,000, uh, if your individual property came up with an estimated rental value of $5,000 per month, that would translate into an annual rental value of $60,000 per month with 10% for vacancies. Um, your annual rental value would be $54,000. Your residential tax rate applied is 3%, which would work out to just about $1,600. Uh, per year for a $5,000 monthly rental value. 
Now we took it a step further and looked at what residential property tax aggregate collections might look like. And we based this on some guidance from the budget statement as well. So within the budget statement, uh, it was mentioned that around 50% or roughly 200,000 of the 400,000 residential properties would pay anywhere between $540 to $1,080 annually, which would translate ultimately when we ran the math to just about $162 million from 50% or thereabouts of the, the, the 400,000 residential properties. Now we made a, a leap of faith in terms of a, a fairly wide assumption and looked at the other 50% of properties, which would argue, arguably be higher in terms of the annual, annual rental values. And we assume that each of these properties would on average generate uh, 20, would have to pay $2,400 in, uh, in property tax annually. And ultimately from this balance of properties, uh, annual tax collection would have come up to about $480 million. So what does this translate into? Well, it means that roughly uh, about 500, well, six, just over 600 million in annually from residential property taxes could be collected, which, mean, which would mean ultimately that 600 odd million dollars in spending power or saving power, investing power uh, from consumers would be, uh, would be shifted into uh, current, current, current revenue collections uh, for budgetary purposes. The second initiative or fiscal measure that was proposed was an increase in minimum wages. And that proposed increase has, is, was well, has been well ventilated is that proposed 17% or $3 per hour, taking the minimum wage to $20.50. Now, for an individual uh, uh, who is earning the minimum wage currently, that would translate into additional monthly income based on a 40 hour work week of about $480. And it was mentioned in the budget that an estimated 190-odd thousand workers would be impacted. So when we take a look at the big picture on aggregate or in aggregate, the estimated increase in annual disposable income that would be shifting into the hands of lower, lower or minimum wage uh, workers would be $1.19 billion annually, which is not an insignificant some and given that the, the minimum wage uh, workers would be would have a higher propensity to spend as opposed to a higher propensity to save, uh, that means an additional 1.18 billion roughly would be going into uh, spending and generating uh, economic activity uh, at the aggregate level. Now, whether or not that translates into increased consumption or increased inflationary pressures remains to be seen. Uh, as minimum wage workers would have to be paid from somewhere and that would trigger likely uh, a business response, uh, whether or not those that cost or that increase in minimum wage is absorbed and resulting and results in lower margins, or if it is passed on to consumers in part or in whole remains to be seen. And that really takes us to the investor considerations at the in individual level. With that minimum wage increase, of course, we expect to see that increase in consumer spending uh, and consumer demand. What would be the ultimate effect on the economy and the investor sentiment remains to be seen again, because the business response or private sector response um, is as yet undetermined. Property tax implementation, as you mentioned, uh, there is a question mark around economic activity, given that consumer demand or consumer spending power uh, will be uh, will 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 come under some strain there with that roughly six hundred million dollars uh, uh, moving out of the hands of individuals and into current revenue sources uh, for the government, and ultimately that may that could we uh, on investor sentiment in the short term given that degree of uncertainty. Now one of the things which would have been mentioned at the at uh, during the budget but for which not much detail was given but is perhaps imminent is the state of future tariffs, particularly for power and uh, water rates. And certainly the RIC is expected to very shortly produce their report and findings on uh, the rate reviews and what the consumers could be expected to pay uh, in, the coming, in the coming months and years 
uh, it, which would most likely be increased rates. Of course, the Honorable Minister of Finance did allude to the fact that power and water rates in Trinidad and Tobago remain some of the lowest in the Caribbean, the entire Caribbean region. So with that, um, very likely increase in tariffs, but timing is unknown, of course. Uh, that again would reduce uh, to some extent uh, consumer, consumer uh, disposable income that could create a short-term impact, adverse impact on investor sentiment. Overall, what the net effect of the, on the economy would be uh, remains uh, to be seen. Of course, consumer demand is likely to, to be dented just a bit with that uh, those future potential increases in tariffs uh, as we go forward. At the macro level, um, there are a, a couple of considerations, one being that level of indebtedness. Having uh, looked at the level of indebtedness, we're not necessarily in a bad position at around that 71% level, and certainly within that 75% soft target. And ratings are, or the ratings outlook for Trinidad and Tobago are currently upbeat. Whether or not that's the case in a couple of months remains to be seen. So the impact on investor sentiment should re remain relatively neutral for the time being. Uh, one of the areas of concern naturally for an energy-oriented uh, economy such as Trinidad and Tobago would be that domestic energy production outlook, certainly in the near term with very muted uh, energy uh, forecast for energy production and in, in need of prioritization on quote-unquote stabilization of natural gas volumes, uh, revenue volatility uh, could come into question, especially with the associated energy price outlook with a lot of event-driven uh, price activity in, well, anticipated and currently occurring with various wars, um, sanctions, etc. And FX generation remains uh, one of the areas of concern, although our Trinidad and Tobago's uh, international reserves, as well as the HSF, remains relatively robust. That access uh, to to foreign exchange by the every everyday person uh, remains somewhat of somewhat of a, a, a pet peeve and somewhat of a concern uh, for persons who may simply want to travel, uh, for persons who may simply who may want to invest. Uh, those are areas in which it's very, very difficult at this particular point in time uh, to access um, significant sums of foreign exchange. And finally, the fiscal balance. Well, again, uh, for fiscal 2022, there was that uh, modest surplus. We swung back uh, to deficit financing. What does that mean uh, in terms of plugging that gap and meeting that fiscal balance, a, a balance in the budget equation? Well, some combination of borrowing, um, asset sales or monetization, and or utilization of funds from the HSF. Um, there was really no, not much guidance in terms of what combination uh, might be pursued, but it is a question in terms of the impact on investor sentiment. And that question would really, that those question marks really relate to, well, what are the ultimate opportunities that would be afforded to investors? So for example, uh, publicly, public bond options or, or public uh, IPO or IPOs, for example, uh, may in, actually improve investor sentiment, uh, given that there's increased access uh, to investment opportunities, as opposed to focusing squarely on uh, the fiscal balance itself uh, and the continued deficit or the forecast deficit for fiscal 2024. So as we wrap up uh, the, the presentation aspect, we're going to take a very quick market check and look at some of the key themes for both the local and international markets. So firstly, let's look at the local market. And with the forecast and outlook for fiscal 2024 in mind, uh, we look at the performance of uh, local equity markets uh, in well, year to date for 2023. And what we can note is that there has been broadly a negative investor sentiment. Uh, when we take a look at, at the all TNT index, which is our local, locally domiciled uh, companies, uh, we can see that it's down 7.7% as at the end of the third quarter. Uh, with the cross-listed index, which is less to do with Trinidad and Tobago, uh, down around 14.6%. So overall, that Trinidad and Tobago Composite Index, that benchmark equity investor index for local equities, has been down just around that 9.2%. Uh, um, it's not been very good reading for many investors. And when we take a look at some of the uh, winners and losers over the first nine months of 
calendar 2023. It's been somewhat of a mixed bag. There's been no clear trend. It's been broad based uh, selling uh, in, in general for some of the larger cap names. On the positive side, Agostini's Limited is up 36%. Uh, again, that's been driven by improving earnings, uh, continued acquisitions. Swiss Caribbean International, a stock that was relatively undervalued. Uh, it does pay a US dollar dividend. So perhaps that may be some supporting some of the value for Swiss Caribbean uh, International Bank. Uh, Prestige Holdings up 27.4%. Again, it's restaurants uh, are not being affected by uh, by COVID closures uh, in well from the end the second half of fiscal 2022 going forward. Uh, OCM and Ansem Macal up 12% on uh, respectively. On the other side of things, Guardian Holdings down just about 29%. Guardian Media Limited down 51.5% uh, odd. Uh, NCB Financial Group with some of its uh, changes uh, to leadership, uh, creating some uncertainties down around 39%. NGL, uh, understandably affected by the absence of any declared dividend down 44% odd percent. and WITCO with its continued revenue challenges and um, some challenges to its profitability margins down about 51% odd percent as well. Uh, on the on the TT dollar yield side of things, we can see that there has been a relatively stable uh, bond yields throughout uh, 2023 thus far. And really, when we look at inflation as well, which has been a hot topic on the minds of investors, we can see that inflation has been cooling certainly since December uh, of 2022 to uh, current levels. Uh, we can see that headline inflation, for example, has come down to about 4% from high single digit levels. And food inflation after reaching around 15 odd percent is back down to just about 5.6%. And we do expect some further degree of moderation. As we shift gears very quickly to global markets, um, global stocks remain, I would say nervously upbeat for the nine months of 2023. Uh, US equity markets have advanced about 11.8%. They were as high as uh, 16 odd percent at one point. Uh, with those uh, geopolitical tensions rattling rattling on and longer or higher for longer interest rates. And there is some uncertainty creeping into US markets and broader global markets. Asia is down 2.7%. Uh, European stock markets up just around 4.5%. And Latin American markets uh, up around 11.7%, driven by uh, relatively uh, robust commodity prices. Uh, it, with, in, in the US, inflation like Trinidad and Tobago, is coming down. Uh, we can see that based on this U.S. Consumer Price Index, it's around 3.7% uh, at its most recent print, and the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index is down at around 3.9% as well. So certainly inflation trending uh, in the right direction at the global level. Now, what does this mean for the U.S. Federal Reserve and its fairly significant and aggressive a uh, series of interest rate hikes over the past year or so, a year and a half. Well, it means that it, we could be coming to the end of that uh, rate hike cycle. It doesn't mean necessarily that interest rates will come down uh, in the near future rapidly, but it does. It, it is more likely to mean that there is some stabilization in the near term of U.S. interest rates uh, based on the data that is being uh, made available to markets. And as we can see for US Treasury yields as well, um, they remain relatively elevated. So for the five or for the for, for the two-year uh, uh, yield yield point, gross yields are at around 5%. Uh, for the five-year yield point, uh, that gross yield is around 4.6%. Um, so certainly a significant change from December 2021, for example, where the two at the two the two year U.S. Treasury yield was around 0.73 percent. Uh, so with those higher for longer uh, rate expectations, but peaking in interest rate uh, expectations as well, um, we do expect uh, that the U.S. yield will remain uh, within this vicinity, this at, at the two year point, that within that three to five percent range uh, over the next six to twelve months at the very least. So turning finally to our investment outlook. When we take a look at local drivers and sentiments, we see that there is that uh, anticipated positive GDP growth, uh, which should be broadly positive uh, for investor sentiment. Stagnant energy production, or at least an outlook for energy production, uh, could be a little bit could weigh on investor sentiment. Energy price volatility as well 
uh, also could be on sentiment and generally uncertainty does not do well for investor confidence. Uh, lower or stable interest rates in the domestic market uh, is, uh, is important in terms of businesses forecasting what their costs are going to be and how they can structure their, uh, um, align their capital structure and moderating inflation uh, is increasingly likely and that should improve investor sentiment as well going forward. Uh, within the US market, we also see those trends of cooling inflation uh, and peaking US interest rates uh, will be supportive of investor sentiment going forward. Of course, your political tensions and increased market volatility could, uh, could put a damper on investor confidence and the possibility of negative credit rating actions in a higher interest rate environment where uh, statistically more and more uh, corporate borrowers could uh, come run into some trouble uh, that could weigh on investor sentiment in the near term. But again, uh, that is not a certainty, but it is an increasing likelihood. So what should an investor do in terms of position in your portfolio? Well, at this particular point, having taken all of these factors into consideration, we would be we would be more more akin to placing our allocation within that more conservative to moderate uh, allocation, which really favors more fixed income and cash or net cash uh, type instruments. If you are taking exposure uh, to local or international stocks, uh, we'd be a little bit measured in terms of that allocation and certainly focusing on good or oh, sorry value type stocks as opposed to good high growth, high risk stocks in this particular environment. And again, that's reflected in more detail in our investment solution, which is risk profile. Again, focusing on that conservative to moderate uh, investor allocation. What you've noticed that we feel a, a bit more confident about uh, investments such as income mutual funds, repurchase agreements, and investment grade, shorter or longer term bonds, given that we expect uh, US interest rates to peak and domestic interest rates to remain relatively stable. Again, with one eye on, on the, the, the dreaded R or recession probability in the US uh, and that eye on negative rating actions, which may emanate from higher for longer US interest rates. Uh, we do expect that, um, that or we, we would be a little bit cautious on the low investment rate bonds, whether shorter or longer too. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your time for listening. And what we'll do right now is I'll turn it over to our moderators and we'll open up the Q&A session. And I'm hoping that there were lots of questions posted uh, during that time. So um, let me turn it over to our moderators to present perhaps some of the questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we got a good few questions coming in. So the first question, this is regards to the, this is with regards to the pool at the beginning of the webinar. So um, can you shed some light on what services it provides with respect to the various categories of of the, this is regards to the last question in the pool with um, if you can build an investment portfolio from scratch today, how would you position it? Okay, and the question exactly was. Can you oh, shed some light on what oh, type of services? Services? Yes. yes. With okay. regards to higher risk and lower risk investments. Oh, so solutions. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's ultimately, it's, it's a mix between, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and money market type investments. So, again, we would be more uh, in the current environment uh, targeted targeting a conservative to moderate stance. So, we'd be looking at things like... Um, like repos, like um, like short term uh, bonds, where it's available, of course, uh, like longer term bonds. But again, focusing on investment grade, uh, investment grade uh, uh, quality bonds. Um, if we are doing any equity allocations, we either look at blue chip or very large market cap um, stocks. So, in the case of the domestic uh, space. Republic Bank is is one of those stocks that really stands out in the current environment, particularly given uh, its correction in price, uh, which has somewhat surprised us here at Boss. Um, so that's one of the stocks that we will be buying at this particular point in time. Massey as well stands out um, as a pretty good a pretty good acquisition at, at this time. Internationally, if I were putting together uh, or looking at allocating my international portfolio, I would probably be taking broad market risk so uh with 
the, the one of the benefits of investing internationally is that you do have a lot of uh, index exchange traded funds or ETFs, which trade like a stock, but it gives you very broad market exposure. So I'll be looking at some uh, index ETFs uh, to form part of my equity uh, component. I hope that's answered the question. Okay, great. Um, so is there available information on the sale of FX to the public for retail consumers versus businesses? Um, I can't see that that it is. I, I know that at some point in time, you know, this was fairly contentious in terms of who was getting access uh, to what. And um, so I, I don't think that there's any publicly available information that's easily accessible. Um, historically, there has been the belief that U.S. investments through local investment companies are not lucrative here in TNT. What are your thoughts on this? U.S. investments through local investment companies are not lucrative. Um, well, it, I guess it would depend if it's if it's like a U.S. dollar deposit or, um, well, I mean, U.S. dollar deposit rates in Trinidad and Tobago or U.S. repo rates would not be identical to what's uh, available in the U.S. Uh, if you're talking about, um, if, the, if the question is really related to U.S. type equities or bonds, uh, it's pretty much what you see is what you get. Um, of course, you know, brokers would charge a fee anywhere in the world. Uh, and after that, you take the market risk, um, whether the stock or whether the investment goes up or down is up to you. But typically for brokers, uh, and investment companies providing access um, to U.S. dollar investments, um, it would mirror, or you're essentially buying a U.S. dollar investment. So um, I would say in that regard, it should be pretty much comparable to doing it directly uh, in the U.S. if you can do it, in fact. Um, and if it's a, the case of deposit rates, um, that is really subject to, to local liquidity, which can vary from uh, U.S. liquidity. Um, okay, do you think that the dividend absence this year from TT Angel brings corporate governance into question? Oh boy. That's a interesting that's an interesting one. Um I I think I think it it might actually do the opposite uh for uh TT Angel and you know I I'm going to be very careful as to how I answer this. Um, the understanding was uh, based on, on the broker meeting that was held, um, which information is publicly available, is that because there were some concerns uh, as to whether or not, um, in fact, paying a dividend would um, overstep uh, any boundaries from a legal perspective, um, there was the caution in not paying a dividend. That's my That would be my understanding. So I would say that Perhaps the corporate corporate governance was fairly strong uh, in ticking all the boxes to ensure that the dividend could be paid. Um, so I don't think it's it was really a, um, in my personal opinion, a, a, a corporate governance oversight or anything like that. I think it, it's actually the opposite, um, but it's probably a reflection of the, the performance of the company in this particular uh, in this particular period. That's a that's a very ticklish question. Okay, so do you think the move by Whitco to change its distribution contract from Ghani Marketing to Massey Distribution is a positive move? Um, well, I, we, I wouldn't be uh, privy to what the specifics of the contract is. I imagine that um, shifting it would have made good um, business sense or should have made good business sense for both with Whitco as well as Massey. So I imagine it should be a net positive to boot with Go and Massey. I mean, if you have a contract, just rationally, if, if you're running a business and you have a contract and somebody gives you better terms, you know, you would shift it. Um, so I imagine the only reason for shifting would have been that you got better terms. Hello, Sarada. Hi. Okay, so <laughs> I have a question here. Where do you see the U.S. 10-year treasury heading one year from now? One year from now, wow! I could, I I don't even know if I could tell you one week from now. It's it's been it's been a very long slog in terms of um in terms of those interest rate hikes, 
um, do, you know, I, personally, I would have thought that um, that the, the retake would have been done maybe three, three or so um, odd months ago, and that we'd probably be working towards um, some stabilization and perhaps a gradual decrease. Um, inflation data has remained relatively, well, some persistently stubborn, although it's been coming down. It's still not within the 2% uh, target long-term target rate of the U.S. Federal Reserve, and I imagine that they would wait for some further cooling uh, before um, signaling to the market that um, that that rate, uh, their benchmark rate, is going to come down, which would, by extension, trigger um, adjustments to both the short and long end of the U.S. dollar yield curve. So, um, I would imagine it would still be about four percent, barring any major. Um, event driven shocks uh, within the next 12 months or so. Um, but, but time will tell. I mean, it's at 465 ish or 466 right now. Um, so, but again, if, if there's, for example, a financial, financial market shock, um, you would see that uh, rate that you could uh, come down very, very quickly. But as it stands right now, I, I think it would still be probably above the 4% level. Could you also share your view on one-year outlook for the S&P 500? Huh. We're getting some really, really tough questions, boy. But that's great. Um, I, I would, I would, I'd be very honest. It's very difficult for for someone, uh, or for, for for both, uh, to um, the the forecast, uh, where the S&P will be, um. Even the best guys with the, the largest research teams, much, much closer to the listed companies, get these, these forecasts horrendously wrong. Um, again, with high interest rates, uh, with some cautious optimism um, about the US economy, despite that lingering uh, concern of recession, um, there seems to be that, um, uh, that degree of, again, cautious optimism. and. And um, we've seen that recovery uh, in, in the S&P over 2023, um, certainly from that correct major correction in 2022. Um, and usually in the absence of overtly bad information, um, the asset, well, US markets tend to just creep upwards. So um, I would say that, again, barring any major shocks, you would see that gradual advance in valuations. Um, usually the investment banks um, have some justification as to why markets should go up and um, that usually filters in to investment portfolios and investment managers decision making so i would say that it should go up i can't i can't put a, a number on it um, at this particular point in time thank you this attendee would like to find out they were of the opinion that all bonds are safe investments but they would like you to explain this because they had once had a long-term U.S. dollar Barbados government bond. Right. So uh, bonds are, bonds are, that's an excellent question. Bonds are typically um, viewed as safer investments relative to equities, but not all bonds are created equal. So there's, there is a spectrum. Um, that spectrum ranges from the very highest credit quality, which is typically U.S. government debt, all the way down to very, very highly speculative bonds. And that is why, you know, you get these significant variations in um, annual annualized returns or yields to maturity. Um, so investment grade bonds typically have much higher credit quality, much higher credit worthiness. They have better um, repayment capacities. They may have um, underlying collateral assigned to the specific bonds. And all of those things give it a higher overall um, higher degree that your coupons will be paid uh, and your principal will be retained. There could be a bond issued by um, somebody else that has lower credit worthiness and the, that, that issue or that bond issuer may not have uh, the same degree of repeat, repayment capacity. It may not necessarily have the same not, uh, degree of credit worthiness. It may not have the necessarily um, same amount of collateral, if at all, any collateral attached to that particular bond. And things can go wrong, uh, particularly for uh, speculative or non-investment grade is issuers 
uh, throughout business cycles or economic cycles, uh, there could be a lot of volatility in terms of uh, the performance of that particular bond. So, I mean, even in changes to an, in a particular industry uh, where there are rapid shifts away from a particular industry's technology, that could throw what may have been an investment grade issuer uh, into uh, non-investment grade territory, it could throw them into, uh, into uh, financial difficulty fairly quickly. And just general investor sentiment as well. Um, if there's a quote-unquote risk of uh, investor sentiment, um, that could that could lead to higher borrowing costs and or financial distress and or even default in some unfortunate cases. So not all bonds are created equal. Um, so in the instance that you are um, in fact investing um, in bonds, those are some uh, key questions to be asking. What, a, what in fact are credit rate? What in fact is the credit rating? Is it investment grade or not? Are there, or is there collateral? Uh, underlying the particular bond or securing the particular bond, um, what's been its track record of payment? So, uh, lots of those, lots of those questions um, should be answered. So it's, um, I, I hope I've answered the question, but it's not a, it's, it, the long and short of it is not all bonds are uh, risk free and uh, and not all bonds are equal in terms of risk. Thank you. Do you see geopolitical tensions adding to inflationary pressures in the short term? Um, I would say uh, there is a filter through effect. Uh, as we saw and felt and are feeling very clearly with that uh, Russia versus the rest of the world um, uh, uh, scenario where it very dramatically affected energy commodities, agricultural commodities, supply chains, um, there was a pronounced effect filtering through uh, the global economy, which led to that uh, rapid increase in inflation. And um, with the Israel, uh, uh, Israel and, and Hamas, I'm not going to say Palestine, but Hamas standoff right now, and that particular um, event that's occurring, unfortunate event, um, it could disrupt, it could disrupt commodity markets. It could drive prices higher. Um, as particularly energy commodities, uh, again, when there's uncertainty, um, there, there tends to be that volatility in markets and that could keep inflation a bit higher for longer. So yes, geopolitical in, in geopolitical um, events currently could um, lead to slightly more persistent inflation. Thank you. And this question is about the local market. What is the outlook for local fixed income and equities over the next 18 months? 18 months, very specific. Um, well, I in 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 the local fix, local fixed income market, I um I think that there's going to be a continued preference towards private market placements. Uh, the major issue is probably going to continue to be uh, the state, especially with um you know that uh, deficit that they, they would need to finance. And there, there appears to be continued robust demand at the institutional level, uh, which would uh, take up most, if not all, of um, these new bond issuances. Um, and again, with because it's a because they're they via private placement, um, the access to the the average individual is usually somewhat limited. However, you know you could you can get access directly or indirectly uh, through any any number of broker dealers, including both. To repurchase agreements or other um, uh, participation or participation avenues, um, local equities. Uh, to be to be quite uh, honest, I, I would say that you know the the underperformance or the negative investor sentiment yet to date for local equities has been somewhat surprising. Um, Sydney, we would have expected that um, there would be. Um, some negative sentiment to, uh, because of the situation, the domestic energy production situation. But uh, when we look at objectively at some valuations of, and again, I go back to the republics and the masses, um, you know, it, it seems to be good long-term value. Um, these are companies that they've got it together in terms of their, their management, their strategic outlook. They've got a robust acquisition pipeline. They're relatively conservatively, conservatively, conservatively leveraged, uh, particularly in the case of uh, Massey, when we take a look at them. 
Um, so I would say, you know, there are some good buying opportunities, you know, whether or not that materializes into price improvements very quickly, um, it's difficult to say, but um, as a longer term, as an investor with a longer term in, uh, outlook, I'm, I'm speaking of myself personally, um, I've been, I, I have been buying equities, um, you know, some of the equities that I mentioned, as well as others. And I'll continue to do it, um, given that you know the valuations seem a bit more compelling now than they were twelve months ago, and the the uh, operating prospects for these a lot of these um these public listed stocks um have I at the at a minimum um not remain unchanged if not have improved with very few exceptions. Okay, thank you. Um, can you review what was said on FX challenges in Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, so just in a nutshell, I mean, international reserves remain very robust, um, well above um, well above international benchmarks. Again, we're talking about the import cover in terms of months. We have Trinidad and Tobago at around eight months, um, and the international benchmark is three months. HSF remains relatively robust at around that US five and a half billion dollar level. Um, the, the issue is the, the, the access for the everyday person at the banks, given that there may be some prioritization in terms of access, um, is, is really what is what appears to be creating need that um, some degree of angst uh, at the at the individual level. But at the macro level, um, I think that I mean, data would suggest that uh, Trinidad and Tobago is in a pretty good, um, a pretty healthy position for the time being in terms of um, foreign foreign exchange receipts. Do you see any new listings on our SME market? Um, on the SME market, I there's nothing that really has has uh, come about. I mean, but usually these things just happen uh, because most of the discussions are held on a broker to, uh, broker to client basis and then they just appear. But from where we sit, um, we haven't, there, there's not really been too much um, indication that the SME market is is going to, is going to experience a, a, a listing anytime soon. Of course, there's the Brydens, the yes, Brydens, um, listing which um, has been much touted over the past couple of months and we do anticipate that moving into the new year um, that is a possibility one of the things that investors were looking forward to was the, um, the listing of the soon to be um, merged uh, Trinidad and Tobago or uh, Trinidad and Tobago mortgage bank with between TTMF and HMB um, there, there was mention of the merger, but there was really not much more guidance um, out beyond that uh, from the fiscal 2024 reading of the budget. So SMEs haven't heard anything much. Uh, the next uh, potential listing um, based on based on the information that's publicly available is, well, should be Brydon's, and that should be sometime in 2024. All right, so we'll, it's three o'clock, so we'll take maybe a... Uh, Another another ten minutes of questions. Um, if if there are so much so many questions, so Carissa or Shona, could you go ahead? Yeah. Um, what is your current view on energy stocks, local and international? Okay, so um, look, let's let's focus on local. Um, when we take a look at the production, the production story. I mean, it's not. Um, necessarily the most encouraging story uh, where natural gas production, which drives our uh, industrial estate, is really going to hover around uh, 2.6 billion standard cubic feet per day. Um, one of the major um, linkages to that um, natural gas production is, of course, PPGPL, which is listed by a, a TTNGL. So it could mean that there are some challenges domestically. Having said that, um, TTNGL has, over the past few years, been actively um, acquiring international assets, particularly terminaling assets, uh, and improving its, tra its trading business uh, out of the U.S. Um, of NGLs. And that may contribute more and more to uh, TTNGL's overall performance as we go forward. So that's not to say that the, the 
domestic contribution to TTNGL's performance via PPGPL is of little point consequence. It is in fact, or it should be the major major driver for the time being. But there are those diversification efforts on the way. Um, when we think about uh, NEL, which is listed in non-banking finance, but really it, it does have a lot of energy investments. Um, it would have received um, a fairly significant uh, uptick in, in earnings and cash flow from uh, very robust uh, ammonia prices. Uh, that has corrected to some degree. And again, they will be subject to some of the same uh, spin-off effects from fairly muted uh, domestic energy production. Um, so it will be a little bit more of a challenging period for energy stocks at the domestic level internationally. Um, well, it, it's a little bit more dynamic uh, in the sense that a lot of the energy majors have been at least stating their intention to um, improve their investment in sustainable energy sources. Um, so it's that that one is a bit more, more difficult to forecast. Ultimately, though, it appears that the world is shifting uh, towards uh, more sustainable or renewable energy sources um, to the extent that the uh, energy majors participate in that shift and utilize their capital um, to um, fund investments in that shift, um, they should be in a better place over the long term. But the traditional business uh, may gradually decline in terms of importance to overall profitability. I feel like I'm writing an exam here. Okay, um, what is your view on NCPs? NCPFG's upcoming APU? Well, um, I think the, the NCPFG APU is certainly needed. Um, the, the guidance that was provided is that it was to raise additional capital. Um, and additional capital in the light of um, evolving banking regulations um, is necessary. So is it a is it a necessary evil? Um, is it an evil? It's not necessary. It's not an evil. Is it necessary? Well, certainly it, it would be um, to shore up the, the capital position of NCBFG. So um, it's an opportunity for investors to acquire to acquire shares um, without necessarily uh, undertaking the um, and undertaking transaction costs. Um, NCBFG uh, is one of those stocks that perhaps has surprised to the downside. Um, in terms of valuation from a market to book perspective, they are pretty much good value for money right now from, from where I sit. Um, that absence of a dividend, however, uh, particularly for institutional investors, really has not um really has not has not gone down well for, for this particularly prolonged period. And that's, that may have been why you've seen that correction in price of NCBFG over the past um, past couple of months. What is the biggest contrib contributor to NGL's underperformance? And do you have any idea how long it will take to recover? Okay, so um, on, a operating, on an operating basis, um, obviously the, the, the lower volumes uh, lower inlet volumes to PPGPL um, of gas would have weighed on um, on performance. But from an accounting perspective and what has been reported, um, there were changes to the valuation methodology of PPGPL's assets and by extension TTNGL's assets. And there were changes to some of the assumptions um, uh, feeding into that particular valuation model. And that would have led to a very significant non-cash loss um, that would have been recorded uh, by TTNGL. So um, in terms of its recent re um, reported financials, I would say that um, significant changes to asset valuation models would have been the biggest driver. Um, on an operating performance basis, I would say lower inlet volumes um, would have um, would have contributed to some of the underperformance. There were also some um, unanticipated expenditures uh, in terms of its international assets. Um, and again, the specifics escape me at this particular point in time, but of course we can try to answer that one-on-one -on -one, um, afterwards. But um, again, on an operating performance, it's down to the, to the production volumes. 
um, that have been a little bit on the lower side um, in recent history. Okay, so let's probably take um, maybe three or four more questions uh, to the moderators. We have another question that mentions NGL. Sure. With some local stocks trading below their long-term averages, such as NGL, and some offering high dividend yields, such as NEL, would you say it's a good time to buy? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so NGL, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, to take a to walk out on a limb here a bit. Um, if you believe in dollar cost averaging, and you uh, are focused on the longer term, and you believe that the energy environment is cyclical, then picking up a stock like NGL at this particular point in time might make sense. If you are on the risk of this side of things, then NGL is not where you'd want to be um, because it's, there's, there is a very a high degree of uncertainty uh, in the domestic energy environment over the next two to three years. Um, for NEL, um, with respect to the high dividend yield um, reference, that high dividend yield reference um, may be historical um, and that the high dividend might be in relation to um, that very strong period of performance over the you know the past couple six to twelve months. Going forward, where there's been a correction um, in at least um, globally observed uh, ammonia prices, and certainly when we look at the energy price commodity index published by the central bank, which includes ammonia, we've seen a correction in those prices as well. Um, the likelihood is that. Um, to that degree of dividend payout may not be uh, may not recur uh, in the near term. So, you know, you, you you should be a bit cautious in terms of just looking at recent history uh, as an indicator of future performance, particularly in a highly cyclical industry such as energy. So, I would say again, if your view is long term, just answer the. the, the ultimate part of the question. If your view is long term and you have that risk tolerance, you know, go for it. If you wake up in the morning and nail falls from, you know, 355 to 320 and you're sweating bullets, probably not the investment fee. Thank you. We have another question on the energy sector. The energy okay. activity with Dragon and Manatee, when would it that be coming on stream? Is it within the year or five years? Um, that is, that is seasonally beyond my pay grade. Um, that is, uh, that is really, uh, somebody asked a question about geopolitical tensions, which is really related to international relations. Um, all of those things, um, would really play a strong part in determining when, um, production from those fields come on. I think it was mentioned by the Minister of uh, Energy that um, you know Dragon was supposed to have happened, or Lauren Manatee was supposed to have happened, or there were agreements signed since 2018. Um, but then sanctions came uh, to Venezuela. Um, and really, the softening of stance between the US and Venezuela has only come about because a harder stance has been taken um, with Russia. Um, so those, those international relations, uh, could change. They're very fluid and therefore it's very difficult to, to put a, um, a, a definitive timeline on when or if, uh, production from Dragon and Lauren Manatee, uh, will take place. The best estimates I've heard, um, is 2028 and beyond. Um, do, but again, those are highly, highly subjective. Right. Are we out of questions or are you guys trying to find the hardest ones as usual? <laughs> we have a question here about bonds. One of the tax benefits offered by the government is the investment into national tax free saving bonds. This person wants to know how readily available these bonds are. Um, I would say that it's difficult for us to see if they're that readily available, uh, only because um 
I, I think it's just, there's a there's a limit on on how much you can invest in it. So that is something I'd have to um that our team would have to get back to you on in terms of the availability. Okay, thank you. Um, another question: Is there any fundamental issues with Guardian Holdings that could explain their current value? Um, it, fundamentally, I don't think I don't think there's there's anything that is wrong with them. Um, of course, Guardian Holdings, like the rest of the insurance industry, um, are now um under the new reporting standards, and it has not changed the business that it generates or their operations, but it has changed how they report it. And I think in light of that uncertainty and the lack of comparability across, you know, a prolonged period, um, there's some, uh, I would say there's some coolness towards towards the, 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 the investing in the stock. Um, but fundamentally, I can't see, um, based on the financials that we see, based on the operations, that there's anything um, on to work with GHL at this point in time. Thank you. We have an interesting question here. If you had unlimited access to change TT to US, would you deploy it, your capital in the TT equity markets or would you change it to US and invest in the US equity markets instead? Oh, okay. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I mean, I think the natural, I think the natural and easy answer is um yes i try i i convert everything and i would immediately go and buy um buy us investments um but again the tt dollar investments uh in most cases they bring a degree of stability because they aren't as subject to the day to day volatility um that us investments are tt dollar investments are usually a bit well of course they are they're closer to home um, you know about Guardian Holdings, you're familiar with Massey, you could go to these stores, you could, you know, walk through these things. Whereas, you know, with some of those, um, some of those, with, with some US dollar investments or international investments, you uh, may not be as familiar um, with the companies and you're relying much more on um, what someone tells you uh, to invest in. And usually what you'd find is that you'd get, um, you'd, you'd kind of, uh, move into a shell and just take broad-based index exposure, which isn't bad. Um, and obviously the, the major advantage of, of sticking to the US or, or can wait into the US is that you know, you're in a, a, a currency that has international um, acceptance as opposed to the TT dollar, um, which really is, is unique to, to Trinidad and Tobago. So um, I would say on the balance of things, if I could, um, I would take the risk. Uh, maybe where um, U.S. Treasury yields are right now, I'd buy just buy Treasuries and just be happy with four percent or thereabouts and for thirty years and just leave it there. Four percent almost risk free with thirty years is, isn't a bad deal at all in a hard currency. Um, but you know it, it really depends. Uh, you know there are, sometimes there are opportunities locally that you can assess. Um, with a high degree of confidence that you may, might not be able to do with the same degree of confidence if you were looking at international investments. Thank you, Sir. We also have a question on the relates to U.S. Treasuries. Mm -hmm. If the United States 10-year bond crosses 5%, possibly 6 to 7%, what effect will this have on TNT's economy? Um... Well, directly, um, it, it may not have um, as much of, a, of an impact. Uh, indirectly, um, the cost of borrowing for Trinidad and Tobago uh, would go up fairly significantly. So right now, um, the, last, uh, the last borrowing that, that took place by the Trinidad and Tobago government was at around 6%, which was um, just over 100 basis points um above the comparative comparative uh point on the US dollar yield curve. So if that yield curve shifts upwards, um it means that we'd more be borrowing at you know beyond that six percent that we recently did. Um in the case of you know if seven if the, the tenure went to you know five or six or even seven percent, you know, we'd be borrowing at, at maybe eight to nine percent um 
despite or regardless of our credit quality and our um, strong fiscal position. All right, so maybe let's just take two more questions because um, I think we've utilized most persons' time. And if any, if there were any questions that weren't answered, um, we'll try to provide a, a crib sheet and um, provide some answers to everyone's questions and circulate it to all of the attendees. So let's go with two more live questions, Shona. Sure. Okay. Do you have an opinion what will happen with Nike One bondholders right now? Ooh, um, wow, really hard questions. Um, I hope I pass this, this exam. Um, I would say that um, it's very difficult to see. It is very difficult to tell. Um, you know, the, 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 the bonds or, or the indebtedness is related to a plan that's not um, operating. And I don't, I, to the best of my knowledge, there's no other um, alternative collateral or guarantor or anything like that. So um, it's not the, it's not an ideal position, um, but um, one never knows. So the likelihood is that, you know, it, it's it's becoming more and more difficult to recover, but it would be becoming more and more difficult to recover um, uh, um, part, part of the investment or, most of it, but um, again, there's there's no degree of there's a likelihood, but you know, we don't know what what resources if you know there's a white knight that might come in and and see or provide financing, or if there is some refinancing, successful refinancing initiative. Um, it's but it doesn't. It's not the. It's not an ideal scenario right now. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. And to wrap up, one last question. I hope Could it's an you... easy one. <laughs> Could you share your opinion on the Jamaican equity market? Um, well, I, I mean, Jamaica is a, a very cyclical economy. Investor sentiment is either really strong or, or really not. And I think what we've been seeing is that um, there's been um, some erosion of confidence Again, that is an economy that has a floating rate exchange. Um, consumers and individuals and citizens in general bear a lot more of the living costs on an unsubsidized or very low, low subsidized basis, which is unlike Trinidad and Tobago. So there's a lot more uh, operating uncertainty in terms of uh, businesses and profitability margins and things like that because uh, power or rates could fluctuate, um, you know, everything basically fluctuates, fuel, fuel prices could fluctuate. So um, in that regard, I think in the current inflationary environment, um, that uncertainty um, has really filtered through um, into perhaps the equity markets and what we've been seeing. Um, but again, uh, you know, to, to, to paraphrase, business is a cycle. And um, you know, there will be downs, down cycles, and there'll be up cycles. So this might just be a, a down cycle uh, at this particular point in time. But um, should inflation continue to moderate at the global level and ultimately at the regional level, um, you could see that you could see the uh, confidence retail. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so it's 320. Um and I would like to say a very, very big thank you to all of those um, uh, webinar attendees who would have tuned in, who would have stayed with us, who would have asked the questions and contributed and participated. Um, and again, we, we will commit to providing responses to all of those questions that may have gone unanswered up to this point in time. And again, let me thank my team for putting this together and coordinating it. Um, they are really the stars behind the success of these webinars. And we will see you next time um, on our next webinar series. And um, until then, happy investing. So take care again, and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>